take a few minutes today just to kind of look at what's happening in our economy as a whole and how it kind of applies to Pasadena and what I see as some of the challenges and opportunities for us as we move forward. So we remain cautiously optimistic that the nation and the state will continue to grow modestly over the next couple of years. And another sign of our economic health is that our unemployment rate is continuing to decline. In 2017, California's unemployment was the lowest it's been in the last 17 years. And we expect it to decline even further to about 4.2% in 2019 as we reach full employment. And the one thing we wanted to note is that Pasadena, um, the legend didn't show, but the, the dark purple is Los Angeles and the lighter purple is uh, the lighter purple is Pasadena. So as you can see, the level of educational attainment for Pasadena is significantly higher than the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the county. And which is also, of course, reflected in the earnings of the residents in Pasadena. Uh, the median household income in Pasadena as compared to LA, California, and the US is greater. And then the per capita income is also greater. The top five occupations that we're gonna be seeing growing in the region over the next five years it's retail salespersons, general office clerks, cashiers, laborers, freight handlers, combined food prep, and serving workers. And unfortunately, these are not pathways into the middle class. In fact, many of these uh, occupations are considered to be poverty-inducing jobs. They require little to no education and are correspondingly lower wages. If you look at the entry-level requirements for most of our jobs over the next five years, uh, you can see the two biggest uh, slices of the pie are those that require over one third of our uh, job openings of the next five years require less than a high school degree and another 30% require a high school. So we're looking at 60% of our job growth is going to be in um, jobs that have very little levels of educational attainment. And why is that important? Because the wage range of the occupations is important. So if you look at the slide, this is the, of the top 10 occupations juxtaposed against the MIT living wage, which is the wage calculated by MIT for what an individual would need to earn in Los Angeles County if they're working full time to support themselves and their families. And even I think $28,000 seems a little bit low, but six of our jobs actually pay even less than that. And so this is you know, a pretty challenging concern for us. The, the good thing is for us that economic growth is going to continue over the next couple of years. We're going to expect as the labor market tightens up and we reach full employment that we're going to finally starting to see some moderate wage growth across all industry sectors. Our job gains are going to continue to be solid. There's consumer momentum now. People have jobs, so they're going to be spending more. And there's a confidence in our economy moving forward. Real estate and construction outlooks looks good, which means that there's confidence in investing in infrastructure and new buildings. However, as we know, there's some geopolitical risks, um, especially pertaining to the future of trade policy. Um, there's political gridlock and policy uncertainty coming from the administration. And the, um, there's also rising energy prices and inflation risks. And of course, one of the most important issues for us is the um, looming housing shortage in California, which is reflected definitely in the county. I'm going to provide a little bit more of the, the local uh, flavor of that um, to kind of look at Pasadena in, in particular. So in Pasadena, um, the, the news is also good. So we have our um, kind of points of reference here between business licenses and building permits and uh, vacancy rates, I think are all on a kind of a positive kind of mark in Pasadena. Um, some are flat. Um, our vacancy rates for retail and for office space are healthy, but not as healthy as we'd want them to be. Um, but still, the, most of the kind of uh, trends are positive there. I want to start off with uh, GM Cruise as one of those companies that are growing, uh, initiated by OE Waves and the, the LiDAR technology that they developed. Um, they sold a division to General Motors for autonomous vehicles. They're out in East Pasadena and uh, they are growing. Uh, Bluebeam is a company that has uh, kind of uh, ancillary uh, connection with JPL. Uh, one of uh, JPL's uh, contractors uh, was uh, working years ago to share um, engineering drawings. Uh, they ultimately set up a software system for architects and engineers to communicate. They've uh, been 
hiring in Pasadena, uh, and uh, we've loved that business model and hope to see more of that. Uh, OpenX is at uh, Lake and Walnut. Uh, they are a, a kind of a trading group between um, people that are selling and buying ads online, and they've uh, been successful. Spokeo in South Los Robles um, helps uh, people um, find information on consumers, but also they help law enforcement um, with getting people's um, kind of public records aggregated uh, along with social media. They've uh, been hiring people and uh, on uh, uh, a few different growth uh, spurts in, in town. Tetra Tech has had their headquarters in Pasadena for a number of years. They're out in East Pasadena. Uh, they are not necessarily hiring more people in town, but they are buying more and more companies internationally when it comes to civil engineering and really kind of water technology. Uh, lots to do with how water is um, managed and uh, consumed. That's really their uh, primary niche, and we're happy to have them uh, growing and successful in Pasadena. Uh, Open Trade, a new group in uh, Old Pasadena that helps with wholesaling uh, uh, automobile sales. Um, Fox Dealer helps uh, automobile dealerships with their web services, and they are were ranked uh, 41 in Inc. Magazine's uh, fastest growing companies this year. We've had a company called Industrial Toys in Pasadena, and they just got bought out by uh, Electronic Arts, which is a very large a software company that specializes in um, gaming and industrial toys will be focused on uh, handheld device uh, gaming applications and they are going to triple in size in the next uh, year. Miso Robotics is a Caltech spinoff. You've may, maybe heard about this one. Flipping Burgers uh, in town, but they have uh, had success with uh, at least getting that initial robotic system uh, started with some Caltech expertise on heat sensing and robotics. They're moving from burgers to fries and ultimately see a market uh, uh, that is pretty deep in uh, food service considering the, the job trends and how some of those monotonous jobs can be taken up by robotics. Virtualistics is in town. Uh, they deal with really big spreadsheets and now um, and scientific data and uh, even financial data that becomes so complex that it might be nice to walk into your spreadsheet. So they have virtual reality kind of headgear for you to kind of view your intelligence in a different way. And so they have uh, are tinkering with that. Irby, you've seen these on the streets. They're headquartered in town. Baller TV is a company that uh, is growing in the Playhouse District. They um, have uh, an opportunity to kind of share amateur sports in, in new ways. Sports protection, the, the group that makes the Vespas, their design studios in town, you may not have known that, the parent company is Piaggio. Uh, Uber Media out of Idea Lab is growing. Oban uh, creates uh, personal avatars. So when you're on social media and also in gaming that you can have something in, in your likeness uh, viewed. So those are all kind of interesting businesses. Others that are hidden, uh, but also big employers, the, the large telescope projects. Um, there are three really large telescope projects happening internationally. Two are in Pasadena, one led by Carnegie Observatories, the Giant Magellan Telescope. They're out in East Pasadena. And the Caltech led a uh, 30 meter telescope project that is over here near Parsons in office space. But hundreds of mechanical, electrical engineers working in town on those projects, and most people uh, don't know about them. A new one is Amazon Web Services. No, we did not get the headquarters or the, uh, <laughs> for Amazon, but uh, we do have uh, a footprint in town that is uh, worth noting. Uh, Amazon Web Services is one of the largest kind of money makers for that company. Uh, they have an affiliation with uh, Caltech that currently is on the campus, but will be moving out hopefully in the next year. And then also working with PCC and some other community colleges on a certificate program so that people with kind of the, the lower skill levels can also help um, find work in um, working with uh, AWS. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on at JPL, but also where we work, our head is in space. So I'm going to talk about 
where the technology trends are going uh, that hopefully will give your, especially your kids, very interesting work, and also space. Uh, there's a space bubble going on, in case you didn't know it. Hopefully it's a bubble that lasts a long time. Uh, and I often get asked, How, what do we think about private space? And let me just say we love it. So now I'm going to talk about technology waves. All these waves build to one giant tsunami, one giant technology wave. And you can probably guess what it is. Uh, but it is built-in intelligence everywhere all the time. It really means that you will be able to answer, ask a question and get the answer because the intelligence is built into your smartphones. And when it doesn't know enough, it'll go to the cloud and get the bigger answers. How do you interface with it? You talk to it. You have your augmented reality glasses if you want, or you show it here, not show what that means. But it's really in built-in intelligence. It's not a theoretical uh, thing by a bunch of PhDs closed off in a room. It's actually coming, and it's being used every day. So new habits really is about the millennials entering the workforce, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, how are they different? They don't have cable TV. They don't have a fixed phone line. They don't have wires. So a wireless future is in our midst. What does that mean? We can reconfigure it at will. And uh, they are able to and want to work from anywhere all the time, which is very good if you're lacking office space. Uh, let them work from wherever they want to work if they can get access to the data. They're always connected. They're connected to each other, to their data. And uh, that is a powerful thing, especially as there's some very large uh, revolutions coming. And I'll talk about that with sped up computing. 3D printing. Does anybody ever, does anybody own a 3D printer? Yeah, a few of us. Uh, very powerful. You can really 3D print your office if you want, change it. Very cheap, very uh, powerful. We now 3D print spacecraft. We 3D print the metal that doesn't exist. We come up with new materials. And what are some of the new, uh, one of the key new job functions that will come is a materials designer. Somebody who can create materials that doesn't exist, can model it in the cloud, we can visualize it with augmented reality, and we can try it by 3D printing it. It's very different, uh, and we take advantage of that. We have to pre pre prepare for the next generation of workforce, the millennials children, if you will. And they will need to stand on the shoulders of the, of the giants that came before them. And how do they do that? They have to access the data. They have to make it easy. And for, we have to make it easy for them to work. So that's the new habits. So we wanted to drive the uh, new, and Mick Cox, raise your hand, Mick. Uh, he is the magician here. We wanted to create the first NASA Alexa app. Our constituents are the stakeholders. So how could we have them ask? questions about Mars, care about Mars. You obviously are willing to pay for things you care about, so therefore taxes will go up and everybody will be happy, especially the city of Pasadena, <laughs> as we get more people. Uh, by the way, of our 2.6 billion, we contract out more than half of that. So it's really for business. Uh, so what we found is we made this app, and for you who have an Amazon Echo, go install it. All you say is, Alexa, enable NASA Mars. Now you can ask questions. For us, it, it's a brand new revolution called serverless computing. Today, we have to manage our servers, computer servers, whether it's in a data center or a cloud. In this case, we could just say, just solve my problem, cloud, and ask the question. And it was 100 times cheaper than what we had done before, 100 times. So we are now reconstructing everything to go that route. Ubiquitous computing, it's really about, we heard about virtual reality, and augmented reality is, is more for business. It's where you overlay the imagined thing on top of the real thing, so you can get much more information. And we can now explore, for example, uh, we have scientists from across the Earth uh, meeting on the surface of Mars using their augmented reality glasses, picking up a rock and dis discussing it uh, without leaving their office. That's the power of augmented reality. But they have to have those glasses. So I asked a friend at JPL, and now it's becoming available on my second brain, the last trend is applied AI. And what are we talking about? We're not talking about the AI, general AI, that's going to make us homeless with the bread lines of 1830. Are we talking about Arnold and Skynet? <laughs> no. We're talking about narrow AI. The self-driving cars, the technology that finds cancer uh, by looking at the images, uh, that's what we're focusing on. 
So focusing less on what it is and focusing more on what it does, which is intelligent assistance, or IA, that makes the people uh, faster to make decisions faster, gets into all the data and presents it to the human, then the human makes the decision, is the next wave. And just like with your smartphone, uh, it may tell you your health, uh, but you will decide what to do with it. A lot of people think that the economic outlook for healthcare is pretty bleak. I'm not one of those. I, I do believe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, because of the economic situation in healthcare, that light has been turned out. But uh, I do believe that there's good things coming in healthcare. And so I'll try and uh, give sort of an overview of what we do at Shriners and try and in, intersperse uh, into that some of the challenges in the, uh, the healthcare field today. It applies to Shriners to a certain extent, but to healthcare in general, uh, we'll try and point that out as well. And so our partnership with Huntington has really been something that has made qualitative sense for us as well as financial sense. We monitor the quality outcomes at uh, Huntington Hospital for our inpatients and we've had absolutely zero harm and zero uh, adverse uh, outcomes uh, in the two plus years that we've been working with Huntington Hospital. Our patient satisfaction in Huntington Hospital is off the charts good. Uh, it's been really sensational and it's been a great partnership and we look forward to that continuing to advance and to continue to grow. We're very fortunate to have some of the best doctors in the world working at our facility in Pasadena. They're consistently recognized as top doctors in Los Angeles, top doctors in Pasadena, and even the uh, 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 designation as super doctors throughout Los Angeles County. Um, the beauty is that they uh, not only are tremendous clinicians, they have an academic approach, pushing research, as well as education of the future uh, professionals, uh, but they, it, the most importantly, they have compassionate hearts. They're at Shriners because they believe in the mission, and that's what's really exciting. It makes the physicians and medical staff and clinical staff so special. So there's still lots of challenges that we face, even though we've gone through this transformational move. Um, we do believe that children are cared for uh, as close, at best, as close to home as possible, and that is really tough given the market that we serve. Uh, patients live in Tijuana, Mexico, Culiacan, Hermosillo, Mexico, Phoenix, Tucson, you name it. Historically, they have come to Los Angeles or to um, now Pasadena for their care. And we're finding, as Tom's wonderful presentation showed, you know, that's not what people really want either anymore. As they're getting used to having everything uh, on their smartphone, um, the consumerism movement in healthcare has really taken hold and people want convenience, efficiency, um, and they actually want a location that is close to them. Uh, quality is a given in terms of their expectations. So we are having to change and say Shriners has to move from saying everybody come to us and we've got to get on the road and get out to everybody. And so we've uh, been really trying hard to do that uh, and to really uh, cast a wide net into the communities that surround us and bringing the Shriners care out to communities. Some of the new things that we continue to adopt to is telemedicine and telehealth and really doing that throughout this m massive region that we serve. I think we're just scratching the surface there as Tom's presentation pointed out. The technology uh, evolution is just rapid. It's actually very slow in healthcare, but there's a lot of work going on in terms of wearables, where instead of coming to see a doctor, you'll be monitored by a device that you have on you um, remotely. Uh, and not only that, it'll probably give you feedback so that it'll tell you what you need to do to adjust so that your uh, hemoglobin A1C is in order and those types of things. Lots of expansion in terms of remote monitoring and telemedicine. I know that the, the Southern California area is dependent on trade quite a bit. You didn't get into the ports or even uh, foreign investment too much, but 
uh, here in the San Gabriel Valley in Pasadena, we do have uh, various aspects of that investment that are shifting. And if you can provide some insights on that, that'd be great. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. I think, um, as we all know, it, it seems like this is a fluctuating picture every day. There seems to be a different industry and a different uh, good that's being targeted. Um, you know, primarily, of course, the focus is on China um, and um, importing a lot of our uh, goods from China. And some of the tariffs are actually on the intermediate goods that are actually being used here uh, to produce different things. So right now, um, and it's going to be a little bit of a challenge trying to figure out the long-term implications of this. I think um, the ports um, and the airport, and they're very cognizant of what's happening, and they're trying to focus on you know, anticipating um, you know, what's going to happen on a global scale. But I think our response is also to find, ch change our focus as well. Um, we all know that we have a trade deficit um, globally. It's about $800 billion. But if we consider that's for goods alone, but if we consider um, services, we actually have a trade surplus. And so I think the focus now is really in making sure that we are able to export our services and our knowledge-based industries, uh, such as professional and technical services, architecture, engineering, of course, entertainment. So I think um, you know, globally, if we, instead of just worrying about being recipients of goods, um, I think now as, as, as the economy and as the um, society also changes from moving from a production-based to a knowledge-based industry, I think we would be better off um, kind of focusing on developing those skills so we can expand internationally, regardless of what happens with tariffs.